You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. So the county championship returns with nine rain-affected games. Who's surprised in early April? Just one winner. We'll discuss a brilliant late win for Essex over Nottinghamshire and review the rest of the action in Division 1. Durham and England bowler Matt Potts joins the show to discuss his ambitions to get back into the test side. And obviously, we'll also look back at the week's action in Division 2. As Sam Northeast registers the highest ever score at Lords, and Harry Brook hits a 69 ball 100 in his first game back after missing England's tour to India. We'll also round up the week's other stories as Jofra Archer targets a return to white ball cricket this summer, and Joss Butler returns to form with a bang and 100 in the IPL. So, plenty to come over the next hour. This is Following On. So, Harmi, um, no surprises, uh, as we heard from Bumble a couple of weeks ago. Winter cricket is always going to provide a little bit of rain yeah. and a few draws. Um, as he said, uh, summer cricket really would catch on uh, in the championship if uh, if it, we could just have a bit more of it scheduled in summer. But let's talk about Essex then, the only team to win uh, in a rain-affected uh, first round. Sam Cook's extraordinary second innings bowling analysis, 14 overs, 10 maidens, 6 for 14 in the second innings, 10 for 73 in the match, uh, and that helped them beat Nottinghamshire after bowling the hosts out for just 80 in the second innings. Um, Sam Cook, obviously the headline act there, but there were, uh, as there always are in four-day cricket, plenty of other contributors. Dean Elgar making his debut and uh, a typically nuggety 80 in the first innings. But what about Sam Cook then? Extraordinary figures. The other seamers seem to struggle uh, with the Kookaburra ball in the, the overs that they were able to bowl. But uh, that is an outstanding performance from Sam Cook. Yeah, it was. It, it you know, Especially with, you know, say the Kookaburra ball. He's with the Lions as well during, you know, the, the, the sort of last winters and, you know, the last times the Lions have been together. He's So he even had practice with the Kookaburra ball. But, as I say, to, to grab the game by the scruff of the neck the way he did and then go and win the game tells you a lot about, you know, yeah, that that Essex side. We talked about them, you know, last week and saying there'd be a dark horse for it because they know how to win cricket games. You know, but it was more back end of the year, especially with someone like Simon Harmer. But Sam Cook, he's got to be talked about with with England. I'm sure he's been in that conversation for quite a while. Um, I'm not sure what it is. There must be something there that England feel as though that's missing to get him into the uh, into the, the, the I think the the, the squad conversation. But what a start! What a fantastic start he has done, and especially in a winning a winning situation. You know that game was that game was largely dead with you know, with forty overs to go. You're thinking there's no chance that 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 there's going to be a, a result the way the game the way the game panned out. Um, it's good to see Joe Clark get runs as well. Good start for Joe Clark and Jack Haynes as well. You know moving from Worcester to Notts. Um But the the, the Essex. Essex won't go away. They'll be there or thereabouts this year. And, you know, if Sam Cook goes and gets himself 50, 60, 70 wickets in the championship because he's durable. This is another thing. He keeps getting a lot of wickets in the season. You know, he, he does play the game. He does stay on the park and he does contribute in, in, in Essex, you know, winning formula when it comes to their bowling attack, um, along with Jamie Porter. Then that door might be, he might, he might bang on it that little bit louder this summer and, who knows? You know, with the tours to, to, to especially to somewhere like New Zealand, where he would he would be more suited. Um, he's he's given himself a good start of, of making a case for for saying to the England selectors, um, you might want to look beyond me, but I'm not going to give you a chance because I'm going to keep getting wickets. Good start. I'm delighted to say, as promised at the top of the show, we're joined live by Essex's Sam Cook, the hero of the moment, with extraordinary figures in the second innings. 14 overs, 10 maidens, 6 for 14. Uh, Sam, Homie and I have only just seen the highlights. And obviously, it always looks like you've got the ball and a piece of string on the highlights. But was it was it one of those days where absolutely everything was landing where you wanted it and doing what you wanted it to do? Congratulations, by the way. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like you say, it was just one of those days where I managed to get into a, a rhythm quite early. And, and yeah, the ball kind of did exactly what I told it and and luckily the batsman obliged at the other end as well so yeah I think it was just one of those days where 
everything clicked and then yeah it was obviously really pleasing to to run through them like we did Dan, when did you feel as though you're going to win that game? Because I've played in many, many games where you think you get to lunchtime, you get to tea time, and you go, well, there's no way of a result going. Um, to bowl, you know, to bowl the opposition out for such a little score, it had to be a point where you've gone, actually, we can win this game. Yeah, I, I mean, we were massively confident that that we could win the game. I think we probably thought at some point, well, before before we went out, we were we were pretty sort of sure the fact there'd be a partnership somewhere along the line but we knew how important with that sort of kookaburra ball the the new ball was um so we were really sort of um focusing on trying to make that count early on and and luckily we just managed to to keep that role going we we looked after the ball pretty well um and the wickets just kept tumbling so it was quite unusual um in that sense that that sort of everything went to plan as such and there wasn't really a, a major partnership sort of throughout that innings but i think sort of the way we are as a team and have been the last few years, I don't think there's ever a point or certainly there's not been many points in games that I've played in recently for Essex where we've kind of not thought that we could or should win the game. Um, but certainly after we sort of got, I think getting Clarky out just before lunch was a massive wicket um, and obviously getting Ducky early to two massive players for them. So they were, they were really key blows. And, and, and from there onwards, we were, we were right in the driving seat and sure that we were going to win that game. Sam, with over 50 wickets in a season twice and, and 48 last year at 19.6, and just for viewers and listeners who aren't aware of your record, 275 first-class wickets uh, under 20. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean this to be a difficult question, um, but do you feel like you've been standing patiently in the line and a few other bowlers have jumped the queue for, for England honours? Um possibly when you when you put the the record out there like that um but i think it's more the the style of bowler i am i'm i've been unfortunate that i've had probably two of england's greatest ever bowlers in front of me with a sort of similar skill set in terms of speed and in terms of what they do with the ball so from from my point of view looking at that it's obviously it's unfortunate but they're two of the greatest to have ever done it so from a from a purely fan point of view um it's been a pleasure to to watch those guys um I think the way I've kind of looked at it is to try to make sure that if I do get an opportunity, my game's at a point where I'd be ready to fill in and, and compete at that level. So I'm just trying to focus on continuing to try and keep those that sort of record where it is and, and keep improving more than more than anything, not being satisfied with sort of what I've done up to this point, keep trying to improve day to day and hopefully down the line the the England honours will will come. Dan, talk to me about the Kookaburra ball. You used it this week. Mark Robinson, Warwickshire coach, has come out and said, "I don't like. I don't think anyone likes that ball." Um, yeah, it's a, what is it? What did he say? He says it makes cricket sterile and a bit still. That was his quote this week. Um, the Kookaburra ball obviously doesn't do as much for the longer period of time with the Duke one, just to sort of get our listeners to understand the difference between the, the Kookaburra and the uh, and the Duke. You just mentioned there your style of bowling, Jimmy Anderson. You know, Stuart Broad, who you've just talked about, two of England's greatest of all time. But it must be a huge satisfaction when people say about the Kookaburra ball, you know, we, we want to produce fast bowlers because that's what the Kookaburra ball says. You've just said, no, it doesn't because, you know, you've just proved that in the in the, in the the figures you've just had. So how satisfying is it in basically turning around to people and saying, well, if you're a good bowler, you can bowl with a Kookaburra ball no matter what speed you bowl at. Yeah, I think well, I think firstly on on the ball, um, I think I've obviously been fortunate to experience it sort of the last few winters bowling with the Kookaburra ball. So I've had a fair amount of experience bowling with it. I think the one the one issue obviously that, that Mark's talking about there, I think is obviously the but it does get soft as you'd know. The ball gets soft really quickly, the Kookaburra. But I think the 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 biggest issue with it, particularly playing with it this time of the year, is when it gets wet, it really sort of takes it on like a sponge and and it kind of kill can kill the ball in sort of one one shot to the boundary can kind of take any work you've done on the ball away from it. Where even though the Duke has got softer, probably quicker the last few years, it does tend to hold sort of better in in these sort of conditions. Um, so whether or not that's the right the right choice of the time of year, I'm I'm more than happy to to use the Kookaburra, and I, I see what they're trying to do with it, trying to sort of un untap maybe new talent and, and different skill sets and, and challenge bowlers to, to do something different, which is really exciting for me. Like it's it's something different to try and and like you say, it's obviously massively satisfying seeing the rewards from that. Um but in terms of 
I, I can see why people have got frustrations for it. Um, but I think ultimately that decision has been made. And I think what we did really well this week and throughout pre-season when we sort of trialled using the ball is just to try and get on with it. And ultimately that's the decision that's been made. We're going to have to play with it. So trying to get the best out of it rather than, than trying to fight it. But I, I can see the guys' concerns with it. Um, I'm not sure whether going forward, it, 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 April's necessarily the best time of year to, to trial it. Um, but it, this is obviously when we've got a large block of championship cricket. So I can see why they've, they've chosen to do it. And, and ultimately, yeah, it's just trying to get the best out of it. And, and like you say, lucky that, that the rewards came came yesterday with it. They always say, Simon, that you know, if you keep winning games for your county, then um then then people higher up the food chain will notice. So let's talk a little bit about, about Essex. Two questions in one, really. Your partnership with Jamie Porter. Um, I mean, he, you know, you've taken 10 for 73, and he's quietly just taken five for a hundred in the game. So he's had a pretty good game himself there. Um, talk to about your partnership with him. And also um, replacing Alistair Cook, Sir, Sir Alistair Cook, sorry, and Dan Lawrence um, with Dean Elgar and, and Jordan Cox. I'm particularly interested to know what your first impressions are of Dean Elgar. Yeah, I mean, I was obviously firstly on on Ports, like been massively fortunate, obviously, to have him at the other end throughout my sort of whole career now. And when I first came into the team, he was obviously someone I massively looked up to and, and still do. Um, but I think, like you said, the partnership that we've struck up is really, really key. I think we're obviously two bowlers that generally don't go for too many runs. So I like to think that if we do get our wickets, the the other team are generally on the back foot pretty early. Um, and then in terms of obviously replacing Chef and Dan, I think could could have been quite a daunting sort of prospect at the end of last season, looking at a change room without those two, obviously. Chef, obviously, you don't need to <laughs> any introduction <laughs> to what he's done, and obviously Dan, one of the most talented um, players in the country. But I think it's testament to the club and sort of where we are and where we've been in the last sort of few years that we could attract someone like Dean and and Coxie. Obviously, I don't think we could have really replaced them much better. And the way they've come in, they've both been absolutely fantastic. Both, and obviously, seen a small glimpse of what they can do this week in terms of on the pitch, but also off the pitch, Dean. Obviously, he's brought a wealth of experience to the changing room, and and Coxie as well. Obviously, really exciting, great character, and and yeah, it's just it's been it's been a it's been obviously a different dynamic in the changing room, but it's been a really exciting one, and and I think it's 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 really exciting where it's going to go, rather than dwelling on obviously the the loss of those two. It's really exciting to see into the the hopefully for the rest of the season how it's going to pan out. And the way the weather the way the weather's been this week, it's good to get a game in front. You're now obviously the only team to win. Porton going into the next game, which is obviously Kent at home. If it does stop raining, you got to fancy your chances then as well, don't you? Yeah, I I think massively. Obviously, trying to we we spoke about that going into to yesterday morning of trying to get that win on the board, play as aggressively as we can because you know how tight the championship's been the last few years. Getting a win potentially when team other teams that you'd expect to be up the top well all teams um sort of have a rain off or draw um games this week is is potentially massive in the long term so i think we were all chuffed with that um and then looking forward to kent i mean you can't take any game lightly in this division we know anyone can beat anyone um but we back ourselves at home and we back ourselves to beat beat any team in this in this league so in terms of our how we go about our business nothing's going to change there as, as cliche as that might sound i know but we, uh, we certainly back ourselves in our home conditions and it's really important, hopefully, to get a win at home and really sort of, because once we get them to get on a roll at home, um, we're pretty tough to beat. Sam, do you feel the pressure sometimes uh, to provide, I know I'm, I'm obsessing about England selection <clears throat> here, but but that's why Harmi and I wanted to talk to you. Um, but do you feel like the pressure to find provide a point of difference? Um, guys like Maddie Potts, Bryden Cass, Ollie Robinson, Matt Fisher, Saqib Mahmood, and there's a lot of people kind of knocking on the door. Um, I see you scored some runs. Were you night hawking at number three? And maybe that's well, it. You... <laughs> I did promotion as much as I'd like to make out. I was promoted to number three. No, it wasn't. It was night hawking. <laughs> so, so the pace then. Um, I mean, are you? Do you feel the pressure to to? I don't know. Try and add a half a yard of pace, or or, or provide that point of difference. I mean, I wouldn't say pressure. I think it's something that I've tried with the coaches whether it be at Essex whether it be when I've spent time with the Lions in England set up or teams around the world I'm always trying to to add pace to my game um I think I'm quite realistic in the sense that I know I'm probably not going to bowl 90 miles an hour like that ultimately 
is not how I've been built as much as I'd love to. Um, but for me, it's just trying to get to the upper echelon of my pace and operate at that sort of level for as long as possible. And that's what I've been trying to do. And sort of the feedback I've had, been fortunate to play a bit more on sort of TV now and keeping track with speed guns and that sort of thing. And for me, it's sort of, I've kind of had to look sideways a little bit at the guys who are playing international cricket with my skill set. Am I operating, operating in and around the, their sort of pace levels, which are not obviously not the the real quick guys, but guys with similar skill sets I have been. So it's just trying to keep maintaining that. Um, I think in the past, I've maybe become a little bit hung up on it, but trying, I've been really sort of conscious not to go away from what I do really well um, and not sort of get lost in that. Whilst also, like I said, obviously earlier, trying to, improve every day and get and get as quick as I possibly can because ultimately that's gonna that's gonna help if if I do eventually make the step up but I wouldn't say no I feel a, a pressure to do it it's more just a conscious sort of professionalism that I want to get better and I want to be as, as quick as I can you say you want to get better Sam um manners you know, obviously went out to get dished out the facts there the amount of wickets you've talked about 275 at 19 uh, does that come with experience what you just said there does that come with experience or is it Three, four years ago, you were obsessed by Pierce. Now, I'm not sure what the Lions' message was to you over the winters. But have you have you sort of, because of the cricket you've played, and the experience you've got, are we seeing you know, the best version of Sam Cook for a consistent period of time because of the experience you've got now? And maybe Pierce is not something you want to be hanging up on. Yeah, I think, I think the experience is certainly a, a big part of it. I think it's just understanding when I'm at my best and I think potentially in the last couple of years I've maybe got a bit obsessed over make like being so obsessed with playing for England and I need to be faster and and like I said I think it's just maybe sometimes taking that step back and I think in the last six months I've I've done that I, d I don't want to dissuade away from trying to get faster and I think I found kind of a nice sweet spot now where I'm still operating at probably a, a, certainly a higher pace than I was sort of three years ago um, but that mixed in with with the skills I've added as well. So just keep trying to trying to build on that. And and I think, yeah, experience is, is a huge part and understanding that you're going to have good days and bad days in cricket and, and learning how to deal with that and dealing with extra pressures that come from sort of outside noise and that sort of stuff. And ultimately that comes with experience. So, yeah, I think that's something that if you could have bottled up and given to myself a couple of years ago, it would have been pretty valuable. Uh, just before we move on to the other games and the other individual performances that stood out, I am really curious. Did you feel in the early stages of your career that your destiny was out of your hands? Did you ever feel that you could do more to push your case other than just by taking wickets? I'm thinking about Sam Cook, and we'll talk later about Sam Northeast. But sometimes, can, can you can you try and I don't know. Um, uh, Talk to the media more. Um, raise your profile. Get people talking about you as an international prospect. Or did you just think, well, all I can do is take wickets and it's out of my hands? Well, all I could do was take wickets. And then that was largely out of my hands. I couldn't even speak to my teammates because nobody understood me. Never mind talk to the media. So, <laughs> yeah, when it comes to that, and, I, and you're right, there are there are uh, people that get selected a lot more easier than, than others. And they're, they're largely down to... If you're, if you're, if the media takes a punt on you, and that's it. it, it's whether that you have sort of two or three, you know, of the more, more high profile journalists see you one day for the first time and go, wow, I like the look of this. I'm going to write about him just so I know that in two, three, four years, when he does get picked for England, or if he does get picked for England, you, you heard it here first. I think I've, 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 I've chomped, you know, the said Matt Potts a couple of years ago and been saying Brian Cars from a Durham point of view, but. Mine was mine was quicker than probably someone like or easier than someone like Sam Cook because Duncan Fletcher, when he came into the England setup in nineteen ninety seven, he decided that when the, the turn of the century in two thousand, we need fast bowlers, and he made sure that you know on them Lions start the ear tours, the Lions tours, we, we call them now, or the National Academy, the likes of myself and and Flintoff and Jones, um, you know Tremlett, these guys were on it because he identified very, very early in their sort of, in their first class days that, you know, they've got the attributes, they've got the height, they've got the pace. Now can we, we turn them into international um, bowlers? 
And I think it was a lot easier for players like that who got identified a little bit earlier. But others during that time and around that time, Martin Bicknell was before me, um, someone like James Kirtley before that, um, Glenn Chapel. I'm thinking, you know, these guys who got 50 wickets consistently throughout the season, they found it a lot harder and you know, didn't get the uh, the recognition as they probably should do because of their first class ex- first class um, bowling performances. I think if your if your name's identified early, you get pushed a lot further than you know possibly someone like Sam Cook. One thing you also need is for your county to uh, to use you or, or bat you in a certain position that you're that you're aiming for, which is really interesting because Dan Lawrence uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, was talking about his ambitions to um, promote himself as an all-round option for England. Now then, um, he needed Surrey to play him, first of all, (laughs) in the first game, which they did, and then give him lots of overs, which they did. Um, And he took four for 91. Uh, I I think, I guess it'll take a long time, you know, uh, for him not to be regarded as a a part-timer. But it, it seemed like a big statement when he said, you know, I want to be regarded as an all-round option. And he's responded in the first game with four for 91. Can can England consider him as a, as a proper bowling option? Well, look, I think it's not so much the bowling option. It's it's a, it's a nice bonus if you've got somebody like Dan Lawrence um, bowling the way he's bowling. It's a bit like having... It's a bit like having Joe Root. You, we all we always go. We always talk about Joe Root. You know, it's a good bowling option. Joe Root is a fantastic bowler. You know, he's he's identified as one of the greatest batsmen that's ever played cricket for England. So, you know, the, you look at the, the the specialist skill you're going in for, and if Dan Lawrence goes and gets a boatload of runs for Surrey, puts himself in a position to get into the England team as a batter and batter alone at number five and number six, whatever where Stokes. You know, wherever Stokes ends up, then that bowling's a bonus. It really is a bonus. You know, you can you can play one less spinner if you've got Lawrence and Root, you know, in 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 the team. So it, it's been it was an amazing first day or first first cricket day because I don't think the, the day started until day two or day three. Um, and we've all talked about Lyon and Hartley and is it does it going to spin at Old Trafford and. You know, can can Lancashire play two spin bowlers? Probably won't play two spin bowlers because they've got Nathan Lyon. And all of a sudden, Cam Steele and, and Dan Lawrence, two sort of part-time spin bowlers because they're both batters, they go and get nine wickets on a on a green seamer on the first day. So, first day of the season. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good signs. If that, it's good signs for England if, if it's going to spin at Old Trafford like that because then, that, you know, Tom Hartley will... Will no doubt play in every game and, and develop even more and more. But I think Dan Lawrence, because if he can, he, he just needs to get runs. If he gets runs, he's in the he's in the England conversation because he's been on tours in the recent past. And I think England do like his his aggressive manner with the bat. And I think when the ball he turns it, he really does turn it. And I think a little bit more consistency. Um, and you will have a I wouldn't say a genuine all rounder. But I think he might be a bit like the, the sort of Joe Root, which is you know, a wonderful batsman, but a, more than a part-time symbol. Well, sticking to the subject of spinners, uh, news that uh, the um, immensely unfortunate Jack Leach will still be out for another month after that injury he picked up uh, in India. And if it, not, uh, if it wasn't for the backing of, of Captain Ben Stokes, I think uh, Jack uh, might have found himself overtaken already but there is a, a, a possibility that he'll be forgotten um and that he has been overtaken it, again you know it comes down to whether Ben Stokes uh, still wants him and also how about Nathan Lyon um having his workload managed by Cricket Australia uh, who said that he could only play seven out of nine championship games for Lancashire and he bowled two overs um in the first round of games and uh, coach uh, Dale Benkenstein was asked whether that constituted a game. And he said, I hope not. Uh, We have asked a question and we hope that common sense prevails. Two overs doesn't constitute a match, but we are waiting to hear back from Cricket Australia. That would be a, that would be quite a story if Cricket Australia said, no, 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 that's a match. Yeah, it would be, it would be disappointing from Benke's point of view and from Lancashire's point of view. Um, because you know, it's, he had two overs. It'll be interesting to see what Nathan Lyon's taken. I think it comes down to Nathan Lyon. If Nathan Lyon says to Cricket Australia, 
no, I'm good to go. I'll play. I'm here and I'm going to play. Um, then I think Nathan Lyon's got enough. I think he's got enough in the bank to, to sort of to to have his own workload and his own um, schedule mapped out for him by him rather than somebody 10,000 miles away. So hopefully does common sense does, you know, come through on this and, you know, them, them two overs that he bowled, you know, didn't really do a great deal to his body. And you know, <laughs> the, the, the Lancashire members and English cricket will see Nathan Lyon for still for seven, but out of eight games that's left this season. The interesting one for me at uh, the Lancashire is Jimmy Anderson played a lot of cricket in the last couple of years for Lancashire. Um, and the news is that he's not going to play that much this year. Um, if we remember last year, he got injured while playing for Lancashire. And I just wonder if Jimmy's thinking that he doesn't want to put himself in jeopardy of getting a little injury going into the you know the, the, the test summer and possibly miss out on on selection early on. So that's that's an interesting one because I thought Anderson would play a few games for Lancashire going in, um, but obviously he's he's thinking the other way and thinking that. You know, by the time July comes, um, he can get enough bowling in the nets and out the way rather than in a game and potentially put his body at risk of an injury. Well, okay, let's just finish on that subject then, Harmy, and um, and and climb off the fence and and commit yourself one way or the other. There are those who say Jimmy Anderson's got seven hundred Test wickets. Jimmy Anderson can, knows his body, knows his game, knows his bowling better than anybody else. He knows what's best for him and Jimmy Anderson should be left alone to do as Jimmy Anderson sees fit. And there are others who say, at the age of 41, you need to prove yourself even more than you did at the age of 21 or 31. Um, you know, uh, it, it, this is this is playing for England. It's it's not a right, it's a privilege and it's an honour. And and you still need to to prove that you are fit and, and in form. Um, so, so that you know, there's there is a certain amount of sympathy for his reputation and his achievements. But is there any sense that you have at all that 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 you think, well, Jimmy, I'm not so sure that you know, deciding and announcing that you're not going to play for the first six weeks of the championship mm. is a little bit presumptuous. I just, I think Jimmy should be given the chance to, you know, like you just said about Nathan Lyon, and Jimmy Anderson knows what it takes to get to. It no, it's normally last week in last week in May. Uh, it's normally last week in April, first week in May when it comes to getting yourself on the on the road again, going into that Test match mode, and what do I need to get into Test match mode? The last first class match in England starts on the twenty sixth of May, I think it is. First test and start the tenth of July. So there's even if he does play in that last match, you would still have at least a month where there's no first class cricket leading into that first test match. So I think you would you know the age he's at, you know, the place he's at in his career. I think the the end of that sort of first class cycle would be one game. I thought he might have played two games, but he's going to play if he's going to play one game, he might play the last one. Um, then I think Jimmy's got enough in the bank to say, right, I know what it takes to get to the 10th of July. Problem is, from a Lancashire point of view, and this will never ever happen, but if Lancashire are going well, they might see that, why do we need to change, even for the great man, Jimmy Anderson? We've got a formula that's working. Um, how do we How do we get Anderson... In if we're just going to be used for that one game, that's that's you know that that's that's going to get us. You know we're going to have somebody that's forty-one year old who hasn't bowled for in a, in a match for what well, best part of three months. Um, what position is he going to be in? You know coming into first division cricket, which is tough. Which is going to be tough cricket. So I think it's it's going to be a fine balance on how Jimmy does prepare for that first Test match. And then there's an argument as well. I think you know there's an elephant in the room with, with Jimmy Anderson is is where does he go from here and where do England go from here if England are and and it's a big one because you know I still think Jimmy Anderson's got something to offer. I still think he's one of our best seam bowlers when it comes to you know the Test match arena. Even now, at the age he's at, sometimes you got to forget about the age and look at the performance. 
but the performance in recent past in the last 10 months hasn't you know hasn't been the the usual Jimmy Anderson he hasn't taken new many new ball wickets um his economy rate's been excellent as ever um his average is a lot higher than what it what it has been throughout his career um but he's been battling with I think a couple of injuries which have, have just stalled him or derailed him a couple of times but it's where the, the but the interesting thing for me is the announcement of Stokes last week not going IPL and playing not going to World T20 and playing for Durham is for me was the first sign of England preparing for Australia right we're going to make sure we are we've got everybody ready ducks in a row going towards Australia and if that's the case then where well, there's a decision to make with Jimmy Anderson because I'm not convinced Jimmy Anderson can get to Australia uh, as much as he's superhuman then when do England eventually or when does Jimmy turn around and say right time's up or your time's up and that conversation I'm sure has been having or has been had um, with all parties if it hasn't then I'd be very very surprised because is it going to be the end of the summer does Jimmy Anderson get another contract so I think there is a you know a lot going on with that just that Anderson only playing one first class match and where his summer lies I can't see the winter lying anywhere and you know when does you know the the great career of Anderson you know decide that enough's enough and and I'm going to go off into the sunset and sit next to Stuart Broad for the next five ten year in a commentary <laughs> box so I think that is that uh, that leading into the summer will start to become the story you're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. Next up in part two, we'll continue to look back at the opening round of the county championship and uh, we'll hear exclusively from Durham and England bowler Matty Potts. Now let's carry on looking back at the first round of uh, largely damp and drawn first round of championship matches. Um, the the derby, the Midlands derby, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, um, South Asian Cricket Academy graduate Kashif Ali scores a hundred in both innings um, for Worcestershire as they draw against uh, Warwickshire. Brought up uh, his hundred in both innings with a six as well. Just brilliant, uh, brilliant performance. I only saw the highlights um, on uh, on the streaming, but uh, what a prospect he looks like, and what a, a fabulous. Um, uh, achievement, I suppose, uh, Harmy, for um, the South Asian Cricket Academy, and he's not the only one. He's not the only graduate to have uh, shone on the on the first class stage. No, he's not, and it's great to see. Um, I know, you know, George De Bell, our, our friend from the cricketer, who's built, you know, bigs up the South Asian Cricket Academy quite a bit, and they've done a. a They've done a brilliant job in a short space of time as well. You've got to remember, it's a sh- in a short space of time, um, they've built up you know, a pool of players that have got themselves first-class contracts and they've not stopped there. They've, you know, they've, they've not just been happy getting a tracksuit, getting a contract and sitting either in the second team or you know, playing a bit part in the first team. And like you see, you, know, you, you say you watch the highlights, so did I. And I thought, I thought his balance at the crease and his shots when he was hitting, when he was being aggressive was was magnificent it was really really nice to see especially from a number three who you know i wouldn't say he came hard at the ball but he was aggressive with with everything he was trying to do so that's a great sign for worcester because i expecting you're expecting you know libby to jake libby to take the the bulk of responsibility of um the batting unit on his on his shoulders um a great sign and then obviously and and jason holder especially with a, a point to prove, trying to get into that West Indies side. I think that was a, a, a good, good signing. Um, you feared for Worcester at the start because of the players that they lost um, and their, their responsibilities had to be with their senior players in Libby, who went on and got 100 as well. But you had to start with Casafali getting a, you know, 100 in each innings. What a great start to the season. This has been one of the great start of the season that we've been for him. And a, and a, a relief for the management of, of Worcester, that he might have unearthed, you know, a, a number three who can can also take the responsibility, the burden of, of runs in that first division to give themselves a chance because it's been a it's been a I mean a bleak winter for Worcester, hasn't it? Really, if we're we're brutally honest, you know, the lost we knew at the end of last summer they were going to lose three or four big players, 
Um, but then to have the ground underwater, talking about having to move away from New Road, it's been one negative story after a negative story for, for Ashley Giles. But he's built up, a, you know, along with the director of cricket and the coach, have built up a, you know, a good little group of players who must have worked really hard in the winter and they've come off and started and, and you know, they were the driving force in that game against a, a strong Warwickshire side. So, you know, good signs and, you know, I'm really pleased for, for Worcester that that's happened because, like I said, for the last two months, it's been non-stop bad news. Okay, just a quick mention uh, for uh, Joe Denley and Daniel Bell Drummond, who um, added 222 together for Kent against Somerset, who might have thought that uh, they were in with a shout uh, just briefly. Um, but let's move on to Durham. Um, now, uh, fast bowler, as I promised at the top of the show, fast bowler Matthew Potts uh, has been speaking to Talk Sports Jack Cunningham ahead of the new campaign. Um, he discussed his aims for the season, the county's aims for the season, the similarities between Ryan Campbell, the head coach, uh, and Brendan McCullum, um, and wanting to become an England regular in the future. Yeah, as a country, I, th I think we're coming to, to try and win. Um, last thing you want to do is go up and kind of just be there to participate or survive. Um, we're not about that. Our entire ethos and culture is about winning, winning the big one. Um, and I think we've got the, the team to do it. It's just a matter of putting the performances out on the pitch. Yeah, of course. Um, what's changed since Ryan's Cam Ryan Campbell joined? Um, just the entire mood in the dressing room. Um, it's pretty much f not free reign, but like an entire 100% backing and belief of what you're doing. Um, if you think the positive opportunity is to, to try and take a bowler down, um, you have the full backing of the dressing room to be able to go out and do that. And I think it just gives the players the freedom to, to play their own game and enjoy and revel in in the way they want to play their cricket. And then as a bowling unit, it's about taking 20 wickets. Um, as we know, the old adage, <laughs> batter set up games, bowlers win games. And I think that's that's the way we're looking to do it, take 20 wickets to win a game. Yeah, I mean, obviously looking at Durham's bowling attack, I mean, I'm struggling to think of maybe a better set in the county championship. Is that how you see yourself? Yeah, I think there's a couple of um, good bowling lineups out mm -hmm. there. We were just discussing kind of off camera that Hampshire have a good bowling mm -hmm. attack as well. Um, Surrey as well, they have probably have one of the best, if not the best bowling attacks in the country. Um, but yeah, I, th I think we've got a very, very strong unit um, and we've got a lot of depth now, um, which was probably something last year we were lacking. We had a few bowlers in and out on the fringe that maybe didn't have the experiences they would like. Um, but now we have probably six, seven, eight fast bowlers across that can, that can do a job in Division 1 and we're going to need every single one of them because it's a long season. Yeah, it is a long season, you're right. Um, so thinking about Ryan Campbell, obviously, I, have you got any similarities to Brendan McCullum? Obviously, he worked under bars as well. Ryan, you, you were saying how... He embodies you to go out and be free. So, is, is there some similarities there? Yeah, it's um, it's almost like playing the same kind of dressing room, um, just with different players. I feel like it's almost not mirroring it, but taking some sort of resemblance towards that. And I think that kind of makes an easier transition when you go up towards the the national side to to go and do that. So it's kind of not too dissimilar. It's not stepping out of your comfort zone too much. You're used to it back here. Um, I mentioned last year that it was just a case of slotting back in. Um, and it was quite easy to do, so it wasn't a complete change of environment, which is, is nice for players going in between teams. Is that good for continuity for yourself? Like, you feeling like there's no real change necessarily? Yeah, it's almost one of those things where I'm not coming back and having to play in a different way to the way the entire team's playing. It feels as though we're kind of doing the same things, um, albeit not as much as the England team. Um, but we're trying to mi almost mirror the, the same results by going out there, having freedom, having positivity, and at the end of the day, it's a game of sport and we're here to entertain and put bums on seats. That's really good. Um, looking ahead to the summer, England 2 home test series coming up. How are you going to get in the squad? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. As a fast bowler, your currency is wickets. Um, on that as well, though, it's bowling hard overs. It's making sure you're fully fit, you're willing to put your hand up for the team and making sure the speeds are up and not dropping too much. Um, I think that's a big one. I think I know Rob has mentioned before that um, he wants the speeds up there as well as well as the wicket tally. The wicket tally doesn't mean anything if, you're fast, if your paces are down. Um, and I think that's just one thing to look at. It's about sticking my hand up, taking, the, taking big wickets for the team, contributing to wins and making sure my speeds um, are constantly up. What's the long-term aim when it comes to England? Yeah, long-term aim is to, is to honestly stay with them. Um, and as much as Durham will probably hate it, but not be around Durham as much. Um, that's the way I see myself. I want to try and be a, a full-time England cricketer, um, be on every single tour, contribute in both for, like in all formats for England and that's kind of the long goal but this is part of, of my development um, being in between teams and that's what I'm going to continue to drive for. That's really good. 
Um, looking back, obviously when you made your test debut, I mean you were brilliant against New Zealand. I mean, does that make you crave those moments more? Yeah, I think you don't realise what you have until until you're kind of left out and you're a little bit on the edge of the fold. Um, and it's one of those things that it can either set you back or it can inspire hunger. And for me, it definitely kind of I'm craving that hunger and the desire to play for my country again. And any opportunity I get to wear the three lines, uh, I'll be excited and be, wear it proud. That was Durham and England bowler Matthew Potts speaking with TalkSport's Jack Cunningham. And you can hear the full interview on the TalkSport Cricket YouTube channel. Uh, I know you're a big fan, Harmy, and not just because he plays for Durham. He's um, he's a big, big-hearted cricketer and and not short of skills. And I think that uh, I don't I, I don't know. I get the sense that uh, he is being earmarked for a, a role in in the big tour next summer, um, India, and and then the Ashes. Uh, and I think that uh, he's in the frame, isn't he? Yeah, I think he is in the frame. <clears throat> I think very much in the frame. I think he. And he proved that in the winter, went over to went over to India um, in trying conditions. You know, the, the wickets in Ahmedabad were well were flat and you know spinner friendly. But Potts and and Cars especially the two two Durham seamers went over there and and they were the the sort of the bulk of the the wicket takers for for England lines against a, a decent India air side. When you look at the air, the, England, the India air side. You know, three of them went on to play in the Test series against England. So, <clears throat> I think there might have been a couple more went into the uh, were in the were in the squads as well. So, it wasn't against you know the <clears throat> a first class eleven or a second team eleven that, that India were playing all the time. It was a proper India A side, and Potts probably was the one that shone, I think, the brightest when it come to or the standout player when it come to the um, the wicket taking and you know for the for the whole tour out in uh, in India. I spoke to Neil Colleen, who was the coach of that trip, and he said he bowled brilliantly, along with um, along with Carson. One or two others stood out, but I think they talked about a little bit earlier about the Anderson role, you know, that England have to get to a point where they've got to get two or three you know, quick bowlers, proper quick bowlers, Wood, Archer. Carson's not quite as quick as them. Um, I'm trying to think of others, you know, Keezy name dropped, that Josh Hull, uh, left armer, he's you know a decent quick bowler, and you, you throw Matt Potts in the ring, who's a little bit slower than 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 that. But the the thing about Potts is, you know what you're going to get with him. You know he's very durable. You'll run in and bowl all day at a, at a good pace, and it'll be 84, 85 mile an hour. Crank it up a little bit more. But the thing I think he has developed over the course of the last twelve months is he's, he's developed more skills to his game. He's learned to take the ball away. He can bowl the in-swinger. <clears throat> he's always comfortable of taking the ball onto off-stump. And he's now getting the ball to go away from off-stump. And, you know, for me, he is somebody I think England will pick. And I'll go as far as to say is that I think he'll play five or five out of the six test matches this summer. And if he does, it wouldn't surprise me if he's England's wicket, leading wicket-taker this summer in the test matches because I think he'd be the one that England... When everything's around, going around it, I think he'd be the one that's picked the most because I think he'd be the one that's more durable than anybody else. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a big, big summer for Matt Potts. You know, he proved himself in the winter, and it's now you know if he gets a chance to stand up in that first Test match, I think he will you know shine through in a performance which will say, right, you're going to have to leave me out. It's my shirt, and I'm not going to give you a chance to leave me out. And I think that's a good sign for the England selectors. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. Uh, next up in part three, we'll continue to look back at the opening round of the county championship and uh, we'll discuss the run fest at Lords and a stellar first innings back for Harry Brook at Headingley. Okay, let's uh, turn our attention to Division 2 now. Harry Brook uh, making his return to first class action, having missed England's tour of India. And uh, an unbeaten century off just 69 balls in a rain-affected draw with Leicestershire at Headingley, um, 14 fours and two sixes. It was the speed of the innings that caught everyone's attention, Harmy. And, uh, and as always, you know, the, the highlights uh, showed him scooping the fast bowlers over <laughs> fine leg and, and, and going through his array of trick shots. I'm sure it wasn't an innings exclusively of trick shots. Um, but but really, um, really emphatic return 
to action. Um, there was no Joe Root for Yorkshire, of course, but uh, there was Harry Brook, and my goodness me, he delivered. And it just reinforced the sense that what you've been saying all along is that, you know, he, if fit and available, he is just an absolute Inca in the England team. He has to play, which brings us back to the conversation, where's he going to fit in? Or who makes work? Yeah, he has to play. Yeah, he has to play. I'm not bothered who makes. I've never, I've never really been bothered about who makes where. I've always been bothered about putting him in. Um, you know, the, the 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 conversation will always come back to the wiki keeping conversation because you know that that's where it's not a case of that's where he fits in. It's that's where somebody misses out. And you know, sorry, fa- sorry, fans will be going. Here we go again. They're going to start bagging and having a go at Ben folks, and he shouldn't be playing and this, and he's not done anything wrong. And, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how England get to that first Test squad, and I think largely down to the fact that the World T Twenty will 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 have a big say on that because if England get to the final of the World T Twenty, I think the Test match, the first Test match, is eight eight days later. Now that might rule a couple of bowlers out, but I'm sure England will pick the best batting unit they possibly can, and I'm sure having the winter off for, for Harry Brook. I would imagine if he goes to the World T20, he'll want to come straight back and play in the test, you know, the test arena to make up for a little bit of lost time. So he looked in great order. His balance at the crease was excellent. There's a shot down the ground of the ones. And it's always a good sign of a batter in, you know, who's in, in decent form, who's seen the ball well. You know, his technique is in, you know, perfectly working order. And it's 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 not a case of, well, he should be like that. He's got a hundred off sixty nine balls. It was the manner he got that hundred. He hit two or three drives down the ground, which you know you you you're watching. You're in awe of you know of, as a bowler, you just go, well, "Where am I? Where am I? Am I going to bowl at him now?" Because you know, the the ball down the you hitting the ball down the ground on the up past the bowler. You're the bowlers. You know, as a bowler, you're going, "Well, there's nothing wrong with that technique. Where am I going to get through there?" You know, there's a straight bat. He's hitting it hard. He's hit it into the ground. Fly past me for four, and as a bowler, you're trying to bring somebody across the crease. Every time you brought them across the crease, you just hit it squarer, or you try to bowl a bit straighter. Or yeah, they clip you through mid wicket, or you scoop you over the top of the way you keep his head. And yeah, the kid, yeah, the kid is a, you know, a superbly talented uh, individual, and somebody I think England have to build their team around. You know, he's got a bat at number five, number six, wherever. Sorry, you know, wherever they can fit him in, whether it's five or six. I think he is a must, and then you then you pick your your pieces around it. So for me, you pick your pieces around Root, now Brook, now Stokes. There's your there's your for me. There's your four, five, six. You can have the conversation with folks and Bairstow, whether you go in somebody else over the top, a Robinson or a Salt. But I think for me, Harry Brook is a must at number five for England now, or number six, wherever Ben wants to bat, and you know England start building. You know their their batting unit around Root, uh, Brook, and 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 Stokes in that middle order, because I think there are now now they are I think now there are three best batters, there are best players, um, and you know where Johnny fits in there, you know is he going to be in, a, in any fit shape to take the gloves in the summer? I think that's a, a difficult conversation for the selectors to have. Okay, just a quick word about Sussex, who did everything possible uh, to to force the win over North Ants. Um, first of all, scoring 487 in 99 overs, cracking on at uh, just under five and over. And Ollie Robinson, um, I, I don't want to get you talking about Ollie Robinson again. I think suffice to say, um, he bowled 32 overs in the match um, and um, had match figures of, of four for 86. So he's put in a decent shift. Um, and I think uh, you are of the opinion that f- when fit and perf- and uh, performing, he has the skills to be one of England's best bowlers. It's just about whether he's fit and, and able to perform and, and be relied upon. Um, and you know that was the kind of the kind of match you would, I'm assuming, would like to see a lot more of from him. I mean, he's got to he's got to reconvince you, hasn't he? Not skills wise, but but fitness and stamina wise i think it's it's fitness and the, the durability that's the big thing from a fast bowler's point of view can you 
can you bowl your first? Your, your, your last ball is never going to be the same as your first ball. But there's got there can't be a he's he can't afford a seven eight mile an hour drop off. You can't afford to bowl eighty four mile an hour and then consistently bowl at 76, 77, 78 mile an hour, average under 80 mile an hour. Just in international cricket, you can't afford that. So I think that's, that was always the issue for me with, with Oli. I think he's an unbelievable bowler, skillful wise. You know, his release points is up there with, you know, as tall as anybody else, the likes of Jason Holder and one or two others. And it tells you, the, the stats tell you from that release point, especially if you can get it, you know, that little bit fuller and dragging the batter forward. You know, it, it, they've never been his 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 skill set's never been in question. It's whether he can bowl over after over and come back. And it'd be interesting to see if he plays next week, well, this week coming up. If he does and racks up another 35, 40 overs, and then he does it again, then that's what I want to see. I'm not bothered about how many wickets Ollie Robinson takes. I really don't. Ollie Robinson can play in the seven games that's coming up. I'm not bothered about how many wickets it takes. For me, it's about the overs and, and, and what them overs look like when it comes to you know, the velocity of hitting the pitch, being able to come back spell after spell. Um, and that, for me, will be the, the test of time because the skill set, that's never been in question in my eyes. It's just that walking off the field in three big, big, big matches, big matches for his captain, leaving England you know, with 10 men in you know, three huge games. And I think that, over the course of what twenty test matches is not good enough. So, and I, I, it's great to see Tom Haynes get a hundred. You know, he had a tough year last year. I think there was, you know, the captaincy that he had for a you know short space of time. I think I think he is a he is another talented opener who who could force his way back into and Coles and Cars, Carson who were with England Lions in the winter got a few runs as well. So, you know, I think there's good signs for for Paul Farbris down there. Um, but the Ollie Robinson conundrum will always come. But it, for me, it's about the overs he bowls, how he bowls them, rather than the wickets he gets. Because he'll always get wickets for England because he's a good bowler. He gets good players out. Problem is, he can only do it for one spell and England need him for five days. All right. Let's turn our attention to Lords Glamorgan against Middlesex. Uh, Sam Northeast. Uh, we talked about Sam Cook in part part one. And Sam Northeast, um, there were some questions about whether he's, you know, the best player in England and never to have played for England. Uh, scoring the, the highest ever total at the home of cricket, surpassing Graham Gooch's 333 against India. Uh, 334. Um, uh, Middlesex, of course, replied with 655. So two scores over 600 there. Um, a remarkable performance from, from Sam Northeast. And... I don't know. I mean, there were a couple of players in your day, Harmy, who were just consistent run machines, weren't there? Who also, mm -hmm. just for some reason, didn't didn't get a look in. And you know, somebody formed an opinion. And is he a fair weather player? Is he a flat track bully? Um, what is it about Sam Northeast? Why doesn't he get uh, more mentions in dispatches when it comes to selection time? Well, he did, didn't he? Early in his career, he got a he got a. You know, he was a hugely talented young boy coming in. You know, then in the he had a little bit of a struggle. I think people worked him out. Short ball came into the equation. Um, I'm just looking at it. Yeah, he played for he's played for he's played for five first class sides in in England. You know, he's played Kent. If you Hampshire, I didn't realise he played Yorkshire, but Kent, Hampshire, Glamorgan, Notts, and Yorkshire. That tells its story itself. You know, you if you if you if you if you move to five, if you play for five different first class counties. That tells you you've got itchy feet. You don't steer long. Whether you know he, he had little passages of his career where he really struggled, but he seems to be he seems to have found a, a a peace with himself, a peace with him, himself as a player and you know as a character down in the uh, in in Wales in, in Glamorgan. But it's it, it's a weird one really because he was talked about early in his career. He really was. There's, there's a lot of talk when he was at Kent, young young kid coming through. Um, he, he's got so much talent, and whether that talent or whether that talk went to his head, or you know, he had a, an attitude where you know he felt as though the world and the, the game owed him something. Because that that's a lot of there's a lot of people in that man has seen it a million million times before. They get to a an England Lions or they, they get to an England A squad. They come through. 
right, I've done it. You know, I'm just waiting to get picked for England. It's like, no, this is the hardest part now. Now people are talking about you. You've actually got to go again and you've got to make sure people still talk about you in three months' time, six months' time, a year's time. And did that happen to Sam? I'm not sure. I really don't know. I'm only speculating. But for him to play for five first-class counties, he averages 40, 13, 13,000 first-class runs. He's played a lot, a lot of cricket. Um, he was talked about playing for England possibly a decade ago. Um, but what an achievement. What an innings. Yeah, I mean... 335 off the back of 410 last season. I think his last game of last season was 100 and, 140 odd, not out, 150 not out. And then he gets 335. It's a great start. Um, but again, last season, what did he get? I think he had he had something like 1,200 runs. He had 400 in one go. So, you know, I mean, talking about players from back, bygone days, you know, if Graham Hick got, if, if Graham Hick got 400 in one innings, he went and got two and a half thousand first class runs. So did Mark Ramprakash. Um, you know, these players were and these players were were, were classed as struggle in Test match cricket. So I think I think Sam Northeast has been talked about, but unfortunately the edge is at now. I think that talks over. Um is he one of the best to, to not play for England? I'm sure he's in one of the he's in the conversation. But I think the young Sam Sam Northeast uh, It'll be interesting. To, it'll be interesting to see to hear the opinion of players, senior players who played around him during that time. The likes of Rob Key, Matt Walker, Joe Denley, all these players that did play around him to say why he didn't play for England because I think the talent was always there. You know, you know, I can't put your finger on what was why didn't he uh, make the breakthrough? And finally, Harmi, just quickly, um, Middlesex's 655 was the fourth highest total ever at Lords. Uh, there was Australia's 729 for six declared in 1930. And then a more recent one, uh, South Africa's 682 for six declared in 2003 at the home of cricket. 682 for six, South Africa's highest ever score in a test match. Um, I think you featured there. <laughs> Your yeah, memories of that game? I remember, I remember um, <clears throat> batting with Flintoff at the end when he got 150. I think he put 99 on and I got about two or three. And he kept, I mean, every time, I, I, Makaya got 10 for 220, I think, in that game. I'm sure he did. It'll be remembered for Graham Smith getting back-to-back -back double hundreds. Him and Herschel, I think him and Herschel batted five days in the first two, between the first two test matches. Um, and we didn't even look like, well, we did look like getting Graham Smith out. It's just NASA couldn't catch it. You know that he was on. He was on. He was on. I'm not sure he was in double figures when Simon Jones bowled that half volley to Smith up the hill, slapped it, leaning back, thinking, "Yes, you know, NASA's got the captaincy burden off his shoulders." And unfortunately, he didn't even lay a mitt on it. And I think it hit him in the midriff, rolled down his knee, tried to catch it with his foot, and it, we were thinking, "Oh my <laughs> word, he got 200 last week. Surely he can't do it again." Got even more. So, no, it was a difficult couple of weeks for the former, well, for the England captain, then the former England captain, because obviously, if you remember, in the first test match at Edgebaston, when you know South Africa got 500 millions in that game, NASA was NASA gave up the captaincy. It was Michael Vaughan's first captain, game as captain. Darren Goff's last game as, as a test cricketer. I remember Goff going up the stairs at a flat one at Lords going, I'd say, I'm enough, I've had enough. I'm going to Porto Benus next week. I'm done, I've had enough. I think it was. No, I think Goffey had not for 100. Um, it wasn't our best two test matches against South Africa, um, but it was the announcement, wasn't it, of Graham Smith. You know, you, you know Graham Smith you know, very, very well. I played against him, probably one of the toughest opening batters I played against. Um, but that was the announcement, wasn't it, coming of age of Graham Smith, not just the, the, the batter, but the captain, captain as well. Um, well, it was a, a remarkable game. Um, it was never going to be a result other than a draw. Uh, right, on to part four. Um, uh, by the way, for a full review of the week's county championship action, you can listen to Following On County Cricketer, which is available every week on the Following On podcast feed. Uh, but now you're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside a former England fast bowler, Steve Harmison. And in part four, we'll round up the week's other big stories, Joffre Archer looks set to, to return this summer, and Joss Butler returns to form with a bang. Okay, right, Harmy, lots to, to rattle through here. Rob Key uh, has targeted uh, a T20 World Cup return for Joffre Archer. 
or at least he's he's put him very firmly in the fray. Um, and he's laid out uh, his his aims for Jofra's uh, white ball cricket only summer. Um, and he has mentioned um, a possible return to test cricket or, in fact, a desirable test return in 2025 for the home series against India uh, and the away ashes. Um, lots of talk um, from Rob Key about not w- wanting to rush Jofra and uh, not trying to sort of get him back too soon. Um, a white ball only summer. I guess it, it, it all makes sense. But, you know, I can't help thinking that the, the mental strength that, that Jofra has had to as, to keep going, it's been it's been three years, isn't it? Re- really, I mean, it's been it's been it's been three years of of injury plagued cricket. I mean, there must have been times when he just thought, "I can't do this any anymore." Yeah, I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were times he's you know, he has he has had a you know, a ridiculously tough time, and that's understatement. He's he's so talented, and the clamour for him to come back is always you know that. But more and more, the, the the longer it goes without him, you know, especially in big series, and you go to India, and he's always on the tip of your tongue, you know. Imagine the bone attack we'd have if Jofra and Jofra, 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 and you know, you, all you want to do. I, I've been consistent throughout this. I, all I want to do is see the boy playing again, even if it was for like Sussex second team, you know, Horsham's Horsham second team as a batter, just because, yeah, you know, to get back onto the field, I think. You just mentioned there the, the mental pressure and the mental fortitude that he's going to have to use to, to get himself back playing time after time after time from being injured was massive and it was huge. And, and hopefully he's on the right track. Tried to bring him back last time in a white ball only, but it was more 50 over in, uh, in the South African series. And you could see he found it a little bit, a little bit hard. And, you know, the, it, it, there's always a want to go again, throw the ball to Joffre because he's our best bowler. Um, but fortunately, this time it's only in it's only in T Twenty cricket. So for the initial part, it's T Twenty cricket. You can only bowl four overs. So I think that's going to help him first and foremost uh, ease back into the you know what looks as though it's he's only going to be playing international cricket. Um, and it's just great to see him back. It's great to see him talked about again. That he's there's light at the end of the tunnel for the lad because you know haven't had you know not massive injuries. But having had times where you're getting injured, come back and got injured again, it is so destroying. Being in the gym on your own, being in the gym with just you know, a fitness trainer, not being part of the lads. I mean, it's it is. It's mentally it's it's such so tough and it's sometimes you just think, What's the point? Um and I'm sure over the course of this three years, he's only human, you would have thought, What's the point? Um, but fingers crossed, we are now on a path of potential playing against Pakistan. In the, you know, in the early part of the summer in May, and then going over to to try and defend our crown and and, and World T Twenty, and he's a be a huge player in that. And then after that, you know, fingers crossed, you know, we we get him on the park consistently because, you know, we have missed him. You know, that's that's there's no question on that. Um, and then next summer, if he's fit, you know, get him ready for the ten Test matches, or what will be what should be huge for English cricket, India, and against Australia. But first and foremost. Just pleased that there is light at the end of the tunnel and Joffre's going to put a pair of boots on, he's going to put an England shirt on and he's going to go and play cricket again because that's all we've, I think that's all anybody's ever wanted. If you've got, if you've, you know, if you, you, there are callous people out there who only see, you know, the end, I think the end result, which is, you know, an England player playing for England, you know, a player playing and they're not bothered about the human element to it. For me, the human element to this is massive. This lad's had three years out. And I think you know to see him playing again for me is just it's just so heartwarming, especially as a former fast bowler. I think he's in Barbados at the moment playing club cricket, and I think that's been a massive part of his rehabilitation. Uh, mm. The fact that he's able to go to Barbados and and get out of the spotlight and uh, spend some time in some some nice warm weather and uh, and play a bit of club cricket without um, too many prying eyes and and camera lenses on him and uh, and good on him for that. Joss Butler returned to form in a pretty emphatic uh, style, Harmy. Rajasthan Royals looked like a really good team, perennial underachievers after winning the very first IPL. But um, it's also true that Joss has endured some of the leanest uh, periods of his career in in white ball cricket in the last uh, year or so. 
Um, and I, I'm not sure whether you saw it, but my goodness, the way he won the game with a six and brought up his mm. hundred with the same shot, and he really enjoyed that. I mean, that was the, his celebration was was a lot more than than just the win, wasn't it? I mean, that was a real kind of um, reaffirmation. I've still got it. <laughs> I can still do this. Yeah. He did, yeah. They just looked, yeah, just passed the bowling ball, hadn't he? He was just, I mean, the relief on his face, it was massive when it comes to, <laughs> yeah, and, the, and he's been under pressure. He really has. He puts him, he, I know he'd be putting himself under pressure. Standards that Josh sets, the professional, you know, he is. Um, he bats in a tough, he bats in a good place, but it's a tough place. You know, it's probably the best place to bat, opening the batter, but you've got to get on with it. And, you know, if, you know there's, you can see why players go, you know, at the top of the order go through, you know, feast of famine, low score, low score, massive score. Because once you get in, you cash in and it's a good place to bat, but it's a very difficult place to start your innings. And I think with the pressures of, of with the white ball stuff with, it, with England, the World Cup debacle that England had, you could just see that, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the shoulders were slumped a little bit and you could, you know, you could see that he's a you know, very, I think he's a very, um, deep character is is Joss. I think the uh, I think it, it would it would hurt him what happened in India, and I think it would hurt him what's been been said about his team. And I think you know he needed a, a good score and a release, and this is it. And hopefully, from Rajasthan's point of view, from Joss's point of view, and more importantly from England's point of view, Joss can go on and have a you know a, a, an excellent back end of the IPL because there's no question in in my mind that. Even if England don't win the T20 World Cup, he is the right man for the England captaincy. He is our best white ball player. Um, I think there was a lot of other contributing factors that let him down during the the, the 50 over World Cup, um, and hopefully he can get their selection right and they can they can bounce back in this World Cup in America and, and the Caribbean because and and England are going to need Josh Butler to be front and center on that. And fingers crossed, a good back into the IPL will certainly help him going forward for England. Okay, just before the final word, one final item. Um, uh, the government announcing um, an investment of thirty-five million in grassroots cricket over the next five years, and I don't want to be too cynical, but um, I I don't know how much money that will actually be. Well, it's it's thirty-five million over five years. I don't know how far it will go, um, and I and I can't help thinking that uh, uh, with the general election looming, that <laughs> the government's um, doing a little bit of uh, investing in in some vote winning, um, it, it's uh, supposedly um, to address the uh, excess of of posh boys and girls playing for England and um, and trying to get more um, more more commoners like you, Harmy, <laughs> involved in yeah. the game. There's talk about getting getting over a million more people, kids involved in, in cricket. I mean that that's a that's a good thing. There are um, lots of uh, private boys uh, uh, boys and girls from private schools uh, playing for England. So um, I, I don't know. How convinced are you by it? I, I'd rather wait for the for the proof <laughs> rather than talk. A, a, a good initiative? Are you convinced? Yeah, good, a good initiative. Um, I've seen, you know, Jimmy Anderson bowling to the Prime Minister. Um, Ebony was talking positively about it because that, that year's programme does wonderful things in in London and trying to get out of London and trying to get into like state schools and schools like where I, I would say schools where I went to, but I didn't go to school after the age of 13. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it sounds great, but I'm a bit like you 35 million over the course of five years is not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. And if you try and get in and, and as much as I really want to believe in the dream that you're going to get it in state schools, I think you're living in cuckoo land. I really do. I really think you're living in cuckoo land. I think you're better off giving it to, you're trying to develop clubs rather than, than schools because schools aren't interested. You know, we've got, you know, I've, I've, I took my, I took my, my lad, Charlie at 14, you know, Talented cricketer, wants to, you know, plays a bit of golf, loves like likes his sport. I took him out of the two schools in Ashton because they're an absolute disgrace. I mean, I mean, an absolute disgrace. So we 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 had to school him online. So 
if 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 cricket wants to believe that we're going to get state schools back involved and give, have cricket in state schools, the education the way it is at this moment in time around the country. I mean, I mean, if you give a school, if you give a school some money and say there's a there's a budget to use it for the cricket, there's no chance the cricket's going to be getting used. So look, I think I think we we go we should be going down the the club route, not the school route, and get clubs and get you know the the, the county boards to get into the schools, to get them into clubs, to get them into and improve the school the club facilities rather than trying to get a trying to upgrade the um, artificial cricket pitches at cricket school. It's private, dead state schools. Not for me. I think you've got to, I think they're looking, looking in the wrong direction. These big hub things that they're going to put in that uh, Mo and Ali, I think Mo and Ali had the first one. Um, I'm not sure where that was. I think it was in Bradford or like Bradford area. That looks amazing. If we have a few of them around the country, I think which is 15 of them, I think are coming in. That's a, a step in the right direction. Um, but I think if you're going to throw money at schools to say we're going to produce the next Steve Harmison or the next Paul Collingwood, next, you know, from from you know the, the, a school and concert where Collie came from, then I think you're living in La La Land. I really do. And 35 million for me is over. If it was 35 million a year, that go, whoa, we've got a chance here. But 35 million over five years. Nah. Well, I'm sure in football it doesn't get you a great. It might, it might get you a League Two centre centre forward. That's about <laughs> as far as it gets. But no, I, I'm yet to be convinced that state schools will produce more and more cricketers. You know, I think the, the cricket clubs will produce the cricketers. So, I, for me, you invest in in the clubs, you know, in the club facilities, and make make the county boards, you know, push kids towards clubs because <clears throat> I think you know that. The goodwill, the goodwill of the senior senior player volunteer, you know, a great club man, they will produce a cricketer more than a history teacher who enjoys a little bit of cricket, who is who is a, a part time sports teacher, who's got no real interest in just basically getting through a forty five minute lesson. You know, your your sixty year old, your sixty year old former, you know, first team player who now looks after the juniors. I think if you put money in his pocket. He'll produce a cricket a hell of a lot quicker than what you know, some Tom Noddy school teacher will. Okay. <laughs> um, the final word, Harmy, this week, I'm going to reserve for the IPL. I'm not going to pass a comment or judgment. I'm going to let, let you do that. Um, Virat Kohli's eighth IPL century came from 67 balls. Um, he, he uh, and, and the Royal Challengers Bangalore lost the match emphatically uh, with a total of 180. Um, so, so a 67 ball hundred, and and again, um, his per- continued participation for India and and the T20 World Cup looming as divides opinion. You know, here's a man who scores a hundred, his eighth IPL hundred, um, and and. Is he stuck in a different era of T20 cricket? Um, you know, 67 balls seems quite slow, given that Harry Brook just scored 69 ball 100 in a in a first-class game. Uh, so there's Virat. You can have him as your last word, if you like. Um, and there's... I'm... I said I wouldn't comment or pass judgment. The impact player. It's yeah. ta- For 200 years, cricket decided that 11 players was the best number for the division between batting skills and bowling skills and just the right number of fielders. And the IPL decided that actually it's going to be a 12-man game. So we're going to play... We're, you you would have been a victim of the impact player if you played um, IPL because you'd have bowled your four overs and that would have been it. You'd have been impacted off and they'd put another batter in. <laughs> Yeah, we it came in, didn't it? The substitute came in in around about two thousand and five, I think four or five. Vikram Solanke was England's always England's impact player because it was Simon Jones. If we if you if you bowl first, Simon Jones would bowl his ten overs and walk walk off the field, and Vikram Solanke would come on and and maybe you know do his batting for him, and that was <laughs> that was the, the trial of the substitute in in I think in just in fifty over cricket. I don't think it was in any of the other cricket. So. We've seen it before. I didn't think it worked then. I'm not so sure. It doesn't it work, Harmy. Exactly. They, every I'm time not, it's tinkered it with, work. people say it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So you know, is it just another? Is it just another one of these? You know, 
it, it's like if you've got people who you employ to change the rules or make changes, if you've got boards like that, you have to do something because if not, they're, then they're, they're sort of redundant. They're, there's no point having them. So there are people I'd sit on boards who get decent salaries to think up of trying to change things to keep them relevant. But actually what they do is they make an absolute holics of the game. And I think this is one of them decisions where, you know, the, the rule changes, yeah, the extra fielder inside the circle in, 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 the, in the white ball format and 50 over format, great rule change. You know, make, it makes a, a big difference in the game. But to having twelve players, when are we going to have? When are we going to have sixteen players? And you can, you can, like in football, you can make two or three substitutes throughout, throughout the game. I hope we're not going down that route. But the Virat Kohli one, I'm still of the opinion he's the best, and I, I can't understand the stick he gets. I'm struggling to understand the stuff that Hartik Pandya is getting at the minute, the booing that he's getting at Mumbai Indians. Um, but you know, for Virat to get. Yeah, so many times talked about in a negative way. The one thing I'll always say about about things like that is the grass isn't always greener. And when you look at moving Jimmy Anderson on, you're looking at moving Virat Kohli on, just be careful that you don't move him on at the wrong time because you know, they, they will always leave a huge void whenever they go. Virat Kohli's just got 100 or 60 odd balls in a game. And you want to move him on. Yeah, good luck with that one. So I would still have him in my Indian team. I would still have him you know, front and centre in the IPL. Um, I'm, I really struggle with, you know, it's an easy stick to beat Virat with. Um, the drum's getting banged a little bit harder each and each each and every time. Um, but I think that's a lack of respect there for me. And I would, I would have him in my team because I still think he's one of India's best, best players. But look, 1.3 billion people in India, they've all got an opinion. Um, let's see what happens on, going further down the line. But for me, Virat Kohli would still be in my team. You've been listening to Following On, and that was the last word. Here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside former England fast bowler Steve Harmson. And if you have missed any of the show or you wish to catch up, uh, you can download the podcast from the Following On feed, available as always via the free TalkSport app or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back at a similar time next week to look back at round two of the county championship. Hopefully it'll be a drier one. But for now, this has been Following On. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.